o Mnichovském diktátu v roce 1938 byla československá státní hranice přesunuta až na tento potůček. Ten tedy dělil československé státní území a řízko-německé území. Zde bylo velko-německá říše a zde bylo Československo. Někdy docházelo při takovýhle rozdělení k absurditám anebo i takovým zvláštnostem. Zde v tom domečku bydlela rodina Jónových. Za potůčkem měli pole, dílnu a stodulku, kam chodili za prací i pro kemení toho dobytka. Když tedy chtěli přejít do té své dílny, museli zde se prokázat propustkou strážnému, které zde stával. As the godfather toured his new territory, given him as the price for a deal, he was thankful that he had not had to take it by war, when the price in blood would have been heavy. For those who had paid the price for a deal, there was only pain. And the betrayed people of Prague felt agony and outrage. But then it was all very far away. Benesh, the Czech president, decided not to fight because he feared he would have to do so alone. And as the product of Western thinking, he felt that the British and French signatures at Munich expelled Czechoslovakia from the family of Western democracies in which his predecessor, Masaryk, believed so much. So he put his name on one final piece of paper and resigned. Výsledky Mnichovské kapitulace byly tragické pro československý lid i pro jeho armádu. Několik desítek kilometrů odtud v objektu Cihelna, například podůstojník zástupce velitele objektu Četař Hrad, se zastřelil jen proto, aby nemusel uposlechnout kapitulační rozkaz. Duff Cooper, who was the only cabinet minister to resign over Munich, said in his resignation speech, the Prime Minister may be right. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, with the deepest sincerity that I hope and pray that he is right. But I cannot believe what he believes. I wish I could. Therefore, I can be of no assistance to him. I should be only a hindrance. And it is much better that I should go. I remember when we were discussing the Gotesberg ultimatum that I said that if I were a party to persuading, or even to suggesting to the Czechoslovak government that they should accept that ultimatum, I should never be able to hold up my head again. I have forfeited a great deal. I have given up an office that I loved, work in which I was deeply interested and a staff of which any man might be proud. I have given up association in that work with my colleagues with whom I've maintained for many years the most harmonious relations, not only as colleagues, but as friends. I have given up the privilege of serving as a lieutenant to a leader whom I still regard with the deepest admiration and affection. I have ruined, perhaps, my political career. But that is little matter. I have retained something which is to me of greater value. I can still walk about the world with my head erect. And if Duff Cooper's name and the name of the anti-appeasers will live in history, I think it is as a protest in the name of honor against an agreement which seemed to them, however expedient it was at the time, deeply dishonorable. Barely three weeks after Munich and in the midst of a rising national debate about the results that had occurred in Munich, Kennedy gave his most controversial speech to date at a Trafalgar Day dinner of the Navy League in Great Britain. He said in this speech, it has long been a theory of mine that it is unproductive for both dem democracies and dictatorships to widen their divisions. Indeed, he said, though democratic and dictator countries differ ideologically to be sure, that should not preclude the possibility of good relations between them. After all, he concluded, we have to live together in the same world, whether we like it or not. 
Now, in another time, in another day, that philosophy of coexistence might have been very productive. But in that atmosphere, at that time, when you had this man-man Hitler and all the terrible things he was doing to the world on the one side, to have the ambassador to the court of St. James from the United States calling for coexistence with his dictatorship was a terrible thing. And it, a ca it caused a huge uproar, even in the United States. God bless you all. There were worldwide protests, the bitterest coming from veteran Czech soldiers in America who had been decorated by the Victor Powers of 1918. They gave back the medals tarnished by Munich. All Czechoslovak soldiers on the other side and the United States retaining those medals to the Allies because their country and liberty was betrayed. After the betrayal of, by Chamberlain and Daladier in Munich, it's not honorable for any man to wear their tin. I have repeated lately that my little country has paid almost the supreme price in trying to preserve European democracy. And I say to you that if it is for peace that my country has been butchered up in this unprecedented manner, I am glad of it. If it isn't, may God have mercy on our soul. Jednalo se o celý stát, který vlastně byl vynechán z jednání a který směl stát jen za dveřma, zatímco se za jednacím stolem mezi čtyřmi mocnostmi projednávaly otázky jeho životní existence. Tohle jsou snímky, které jsem viděl už mnohokrát a nikdy mě ještě nenechávají zapomenout na to, co se stalo. To já jsem tehdy natáčel někde na Jižní Moravě, a tam byli lidé, většinou židé, kteří nemohli k nám, protože neměli zdejší příslušnost a nemohli zpátky, protože tam je čekal osud nejhorší. Tak se pohybovali jako štvaná zvířata v kleci a tam zůstávali odsouzení k tomu, že jim místní lidé aspoň vypomáhali slámou a nějakým přísunem nějakých potravin. A tak ta situace vypadala po celé dva, tři dny, které tam byli nuceni strávit. Do dneška je to určitý kašmár, nightmare, kterou prožívám každou špatnou svou noc, že se mi tyto scény vracejí ještě a Nevím, co bych vám ještě k tomu řekl, je to špatná doba. Špatná doba.